Well, so delighted that you're with us today, and uh, we have two very special friends with us in church this morning. Pastors Mark and Jan Serpentine. Let's give them a great welcome this morning, all the way from South Africa, just north of Cape Town. And you know, Everybody thinks Cape Town and around that area in South Africa is hot all the time. But Mark, Jan, it's your winter right now, so you're used to cold and rain there. So today's a nice day for them. It is so good to have you with us. And uh, I'm going to be inviting Mark onto the platform to help me. I'm not sure whether he, he I, I think he knows that in a moment. Not, not yet. But uh, I just want to tell you about Mark's life raised from the dead not once twice twice we have our own Lazarus with us this morning but as if that wasn't enough for him and his wife who I have to say is a great woman of faith he is he's carrying with him right now inside his body 24 kidney stones correct a few days before you flew, you had an operation to bypass your kidneys and they said, you can't fly, you said, I'm going. I have never known such an inspirational man that takes all this on the chin and still believes God. Still believes God. They run a fantastic church called Rock Church in Paul. But since his resurrection, He's had some other things to put up with as well. So not so long ago, Mark, you went in for checkups and they told you you had prostate cancer. By the time you'd gone back for more tests, they told you it had spread, correct, into your pelvis. They told you, this is for everybody here right now, that either you are here or you know somebody, you were diagnosed when you went back in stage four cancer. Stage four cancer. And they said, this is it. We've used the best piece of equipment. And Jan, you were in the room at the time. And you stopped the best surgeon in, the Cape, in Cape Town. And you said, no, no way. No way. This is in the doctor's office. No way. He said, yes way. He, she said, you've got it wrong. He said, love, we can't have it wrong. This is millions of pounds worth of equipment that have done the scan we can prove to you that he has stage four cancer he has just been told there is no trace of cancer in his body he's a miracle our god is a miracle if you want anybody to pray for you this morning you better get into that foyer because Mark and Jan, I want you straight after the service in the foyer. And you better, you better get this man's hands laid upon you because he's got faith. My wife is shouting, he's got faith. He's got faith. And I want to tell you, he's the real, they are the real deal. They're actually living with us at the moment. They are the real deal. While they've been with us, their church has got broken into. They're having to go through insurance and everything. But you know what? They just keep carrying on and carrying on. And I just want you to feel that spirit, the spirit of God in them this morning that says, hey, you may have been diagnosed. You may have been diagnosed with stage four. And they've said, no, be like Jan. Say, hey, hang on a bit. Hang on a bit. My God tells me that he's my healer. So why don't we stop right now and pray? Ready? Lift your hands towards heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus today. All over this building, everybody down the end of that camera watching later today online. In the name of Jesus right there on your sofa. We say stage four cancer. We don't care. We care about the people. But we tell you, get your dirty hands off these people. I declare today you will not die, but like Mark, you will live to declare the works of the Lord. And right now, come on everybody, we thank Jesus for His healing 
power in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Anybody ready for the Word of God today? Well, if you weren't here, yes, if you weren't here last, I was going to say yesterday, I wasn't here yesterday. If you weren't here last week, we started a mini-series, part two this week. It finishes today. It started last week, finishes today. It's a quick one. It's called this. Don't allow folk, stop allowing folk to keep you broke. There are so many negative people, Mark, so many negative people around. So many people who don't want you to be blessed. They don't want you to be successful. In fact, if you are seemingly successful and blessed and prosperous, something must be wrong with you. So I'm going to do again what I did last week. I'm going to give you five things this morning to take home with you. Hang your hat on these five things. And I'm going to show you five things that are going to change your life. Stop allowing folk, say folk, to keep you broke. Some of you may say, that's a cheesy, that's a cheesy title for a message. I don't care. Give me more cheese, I say. It's true. Too many people want you broke. So we're going to read the Word of God. It's a really, really long reading this morning. You're going to be on your feet for I don't know how long. It's one verse. So blink and you miss it. Are you ready? Turn with me in your Bible. Some of you are looking at your iPhones. You buy, have the Bible on your iPhone. Some of you are on your iPad. But you can be old-fashioned like me and use your eyelids. You can look at the screen. One verse will change everything about your life. Do not be deceived. I'm going to break down these words for you back into the ancient Greek in which they were written. So I'm going to about to tell you what it means. Do not be deceived. The Greek word there means this. Do not get off track. Don't let anybody con you that this is not real. Keep on track. That's what it means. Keep on track, folks. Child of God, son of God, daughter of God, keep on track. God cannot be mocked. The word mocked there in ancient Greek is the word to turn your nose up at. So let me read it again. Do not get off track or turn your nose up at God because a man reaps and a woman reaps what he sows. Friends, before you take your seats, I want you to know this. You already know it, so let me remind you that this always works. It is a never diminishing law it's like gravity you can say I don't believe in gravity okay jump on the top of this building afterwards then and jump and shout I don't believe in gravity <laughs> it doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or not your nana it's true do you know that this verse is true whether you believe in God or not this verse never changes. You may, you may not even know Jesus for yourself personally. You say, oh, well, this isn't for me because I'm not a Christian. I don't want to. Hey, this verse is a law. You can't change it. You can't stop it. So here's the deal today, friends. Are you ready? The sooner you decide to take part in this, the sooner your life will get out of where you are. Some of you are broke and say, I don't believe this. I don't want to hear this stuff. And by the way, we've had people say about this, oh, that's one of those prosperity gospel churches. No, we're not. I don't preach a prosperity gospel. I preach a generosity gospel, which means that you are selfish if you only look after you. But if you have more than enough, we can feed the poor. We can do everything we want to do. 
So you better believe that the Bible is a generous book. God is a generous God. So this is part two. Let's have some fun today. But let's hear the word of God, shall we? Holy Spirit, let's go. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take your seat, shall we? This morning. This is the most powerful verse, and I want you to know that sowing and reaping doesn't apply to one area. It applies to every area. Listen to me carefully. If I sow love, what do I reap? I don't reap hate. I reap love. If I sow forgiveness, I reap forgiveness. This church, I hope you found it to be true, is a friendly church. We don't put it on. We don't train how to be friendly. We're just friendly because we've sowed for 30 years friendliness towards people. Our church is reaping friendliness. If I sow bitterness, I will reap bitterness. The Bible says don't judge because with the same judgment you use, it will be judged back to you. If you keep finding that your mates and your office are very judgmental, or oh, they're always judging me, look in the mirror and ask yourself, how many times do you keep gossiping and judging people? You see, the Bible tells us that sowing and reaping affects every area of our life at all times. However, listen to this carefully. When the Bible talks about sowing seed, it always has a connotation towards finance. So sowing and reaping affects everything. If I sow love to my wife, I receive, or I should do anyway, I'm looking that way, I receive love. Whatever you sow, you reap. God said it doesn't matter whether you go agree with it or not, it still works. You can be a million miles away from God today. It is a law set into this world. You can't escape it, so you may as well join in with it. When I came to know Jesus at 17-ish years of age, I decided the greatest way that I could live my life was to participate in sowing and reaping. In Genesis 8, 22, it's only eight chapters from the beginning of the Bible, obviously. It says these words, As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, depending on where you live, day and night will never cease. There are too many people on our planet right now too messed up trying to save the planet when God has said, I don't need any help. Some of you just got offended by that. Well, Pastor Mark, shouldn't we do everything? Of course we should do everything we can to save the planet. Of course we should be responsible. God gave us this beautiful world. Let's look after it. But God's promise to you is, oh, it disappeared. God's promise to you is somewhere there. As long as the earth remains, there are four things that will never cease. If you're making notes, write them down. Take a photo of the screen if you want to. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. Now let me ask you this question. Does day and night happen occasionally? Hello? Some of you are scared to answer because you think I'll get it wrong. This is a simple question. <laughs> you know, since the day I was born, every, every, day, every day there's been a day. Sounds simplistic. Come on. Every night when I went to bed, it went dark. We are blessed with long summer nights right now. Ever since I've been born, there's been cold and cold. Oh, I'm sorry. We live in England. Cold and heat. In Cape Town, South Africa, it's cold. Here, this is what we call warm. They say it's a freezing day. There is cold and heat every year. Every year that I've been born, there has been a summer and a winter. It's like clockwork. So there's been day and night, summer and winter, cold and heat. 
so they don't happen occasionally when they feel like it. They don't just, oh, I think we'll have a, let's have a day and a night today. They happen systematically every single day like clockwork. We're in summertime now. And because we've already hit summer's day, that means it's going to start getting darker by two minutes every day from now on. Sorry to depress you. God times systematically everything. In those four things that will never cease, the first one is seed time and harvest will never, ever cease. That means that you can participate in seed time, sowing seed and harvest every single day of your life till you die. Because like day and night, summer and winter, cold and heat, it is there every single day. It is certainly here today. It will be here tomorrow. Its power will never die. Therefore, you may as well get ready. Just like every year, you get ready for your summer holidays and get your stuff out and you get your bikini and your, your trunks out and you go, oh, I'm looking forward to the summer. And the kids' paddling pool has been stored in the garage for the last three summers because we didn't have one. <laughs> Everything revolves around this. Now, I'm taking time with this because I want you to understand something. Every person on the planet can participate regularly, daily, moment by moment in something called seed time and harvest. It's very interesting to find there is a link between seed and harvest and it's the word time, T-I-M-E. If you are, like a farmer is, a seed sower, you have to understand that between seed and harvest, there is the word time. You don't plant a seed today. You don't give an offering today and wake up in the middle of the night saying, God, it's not in my account yet. You have to wait time. God will always bring a harvest, but you may have to wait for it. If I plant like my, the farmers out there in the fields, they plant stuff, lettuce, seed, whatever, potatoes, whatever it may be. They don't get up the next day and go, it don't work, it don't work. They wait for the correct time and the correct season. And then they go out and go, wow, it's starting to sprout. The, everything's growing nicely. So they plant seed. They're going to get a harvest. But the time is of the essence. Stop being a microwave spoilt Christian. Whereby you, oh, I gave, Pastor Mark said the church was in need and they had a crisis of finance. Oh, and all of that. I heard him say it last week. I sold last week and I still haven't had a harvest. Oh, stop it. Grow up. God is not going to just go, hey, you sowed, therefore it can happen. It does happen. It will happen. But mainly the way it happens is you sow seed and it takes time. I have to sow daily seeds in my marriage, daily seeds in my kids, daily seeds with my grandchildren in the belief that my marriage, my kids, my grandchildren, my family will be blessed and prosper. There will be times, my, my kids are not exemption, when kids will say to you, Dad, I hate you. I remember it on two occasions as our kids were growing, I hate you. What are you going to do? Go, I hate you back. <laughs> no, into that soil you sow love and expectation that you'll hate one day. I think you will probably start to love me and realize what I just told you. I'm absolutely right. Anybody out there? It will not cease. Let's see it in operation before I give you five things. We're going to go now from Genesis 8 through a few chapters, and we're going to get to Genesis 26, I believe. Genesis 26. Are you ready? Now, there was a famine in the land, it says. Interest rates had gone through the roof. 13 interest rate hikes for Abraham. You know, I'm adding 
the MB translation. Oh, I, I haven't heard of that, Mark Birchland. Okay. <laughs> Besides the previous interest rates of the last year. You understand I'm adding. You say it doesn't say that. No, I'm adding a bit to it. Are you you're with me to make it 2023? Now, there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. So this is the son, Isaac, and his dad went through a famine. His son's going through a famine that tells me that you'll go through a famine and your next generation will all go through hard times. There will be all of what we're experiencing now. It'll happen again. So Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines in Gerar. Now the Philistines, of course, are the enemy. And the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, hey, don't go down to Egypt. The reason he said that is because Isaac thought, hey, there's no food here. Nothing's happening here. I'm going to go back down to the land of slavery. And at least they've got some food. God said, don't do it. You're a man of God. Stay where you are. Live in the land I tell you to live. Stay in Netherton. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and I will bless you. For you and your descendants, I will give you all of these lands and confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make you descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and I will give you all of these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on the earth will be blessed. Now get ready. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commandments and instructions and decrees. Now, here we go. So Isaac stayed, say stayed, stayed in Gerar in Philistine territory. Is that, is that the last bit? Oh, that must be the last. Did I just read that he planted? Did I, did I just read that he said, uh, did he sow a hundred and reaped a hundred times? No, that means something went a little bit wrong there. Did we miss a verse? Okay, well, let me explain it rather than having to worry about that. It's probably my fault. Rather than me blame somebody else. As he stays there, the Bible says that he planted and sowed in a double famine and reaped in the same year not next year, not the third year, the same year he reaped a hundredfold. Now that, friends, is supernatural. So let me say this. Think about it. We today, as every generation, we live in the land of the Philistines because there are people, giants all around us, talking to us every day. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, keep you broke. Yeah, yeah. You can't escape where you live. I don't like the street where I live. A lady said to me in our church many, many years ago, she said, Pastor Mark, I'm moving house. Why? You've moved before. She said, I'm moving again. There's something wrong with this house I've moved into. I said, what's the matter? She said, I don't know. Everything keeps going wrong. I'm fighting the devil every day, fighting, 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 fighting. And she was developing this really negative spirit. She said, I'm going to move because I believe if I move, things will change. I said, can I just give you a word of advice? When you move, you're taking yourself with you. <laughs> Stop fighting. Listen, don't try and escape living on this planet. God said, stay where you are. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you instructions for where you live. Wherever you live, whether it's in some crummy place or amazing place, maybe it's a bedsit or a mansion, maybe you live in a castle or some kind of place you hate and despise. Listen carefully. Don't try. Yes, by all means, think bigger and better and all of that kind of stuff. But listen carefully. Where you are today, God will instruct you how to get out of it by sowing and reaping. Did you know that Isaac, from that first sowing and reaping a hundredfold, become one of the wealthiest men in the whole of the Bible? Why? Because he wasn't in enemy territory? No, he was between not quite enough, more than enough, just enough, and not enough. And that's where you and I live. We live in the land of not quite enough, just enough and not enough. 
And our day will fluctuate between we don't have enough and then there'll be more than enough. We live in this land. So what do we do? Oh, I'm going to escape it. I'm going to go and live. I want to go and live with Mark and Jan in Cape Town. That's a beautiful place. Now, that's exactly what they experienced there themselves. The scenery will change, but you won't. So what do we do? We, we obey instructions, whether you live in Netherton, Dudley, or surrounding areas of the black country, as we call it. You have to obey, obey, me too, the instruction to sow in that land. And the problem is, some of us don't know how to follow instructions. I'm going to invite Pastor Mark to come to the stage. Just gra gra grab a microphone, Mark, will you please? And I've brought with me, I, I don't know how this is going to go. I mean, it may go brilliant, it may go terrible. Good morning, Mark. Lazarus, come on, raised from the dead twice. Come on, he's alive. He's alive. Come out, Lazarus. Thank you so much. Okay, Mark, so uh, I want you to go and stand over there by, maybe there. Not there, there, just there, there, yeah. No, don't put your foot there, just put your foot there. there. Okay. You should know all these things, you're resurrected. Okay, so Mark, you can turn this way for a moment. This is a jacket, okay? There we go. One of my jackets, nice colorful inside, okay? The problem is, Mark, in this area, I, have, I don't know what a jacket is. Are you with me? I've, I've, I've never really seen one, I've never worn one, so I don't know how to put one on. I don't know anything about a jacket. I don't know what they're for. So this is to demonstrate how amazing you are since your resurrection. <laughs> so what you're going to do is you're going to turn around and you're going to instruct me how to put that jacket on. Now, it sounds simple. Let's f find out how we go. You turn around. I'll tell you that without looking at you. Without looking. Turn around. Yeah. Okay. Is your foot in the right? Yeah, right there. That's it. Okay. Is, you, is your mic on? Okay. Okay, so Mark, the jacket is exactly... Is yeah, J just be quiet for a minute, Mark. Uh, <laughs> I know you've been resurrected, but be quiet. <laughs> Listen, the jacket is where I left it, Mark, so now I want you to tell me how I am supposed to do something I've never done before. What, Move to towards the jacket. Sorry? Move towards the jacket. Yes, I'm very close. Bend down and pick the jacket up. Thank you, yeah. Okay, I've done that, Mark. I've got the All jacket. Right. Um, face the buttons away from you and hold the jacket at the top of the sleeves. Uh, mm -hmm. That's too much information. <laughs> so these long things on the side... Those are sleeves, sorry. Yep. All right, uh, hold the material in your hand. Yes, I'm doing that. on the side... Yeah. Are uh, long sleeves. Yes. And hold the top of the sleeves. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah, I got it. Yeah, the top are of you the there? sleeves. Yeah, yeah, I got the top of the sleeves. Right. Yeah, yeah. Then what you need yeah. to do, yeah. take one of your arms and push it through the sleeve. Okay. Make, wait, right. making sure that the colored pattern yes. is on the inside yeah, of that's the correct. jacket. Absolutely correct. All right. Hang, hang, hang on a bit, it's taking time. All right. Just a moment. Are you sure i got to put my hands through the sleeve? Through the whole sleeve. Yeah, through the whole Stick sleeve. Stick out the other side of the sleeve. Yeah, I've done Wiggle it. Wiggle your fingers. Yeah, my hands are through. I'm wiggling my fingers, yeah. All right. Okay. But you've got to make sure yeah. that the side that doesn't have the buttons. The side that doesn't have the buttons. This side, yeah. Is on your back side. Back side. On my back side. Of your back. <laughs> okay, this is, Mark, this is tricky. All right. Mark, Mark, yes. it's, it's dark. It's dark in here. <laughs> it's dark in here. No, well, push it down so that you can do the buttons up. Say that again. Push the jacket down. Push the jacket down. So you can down. do the buttons up in the front. Hang on a bit. Uh, I can't see the buttons. In the front of the jacket, there will be buttons, and on the other side will be two slits. You have to place the button through the slits uh, with your fingers that are through the sleeves. Right. All right. Now, yeah. you should be able to puff your chest out. 
I should be able to what? Puff your chest out. Yeah, I can do that. Because you've yeah. done the jacket up so that you can raise your hands to worship the Lord. Yeah, okay. Mark. Yes. Mark. Yes. You might as well be talking double Dutch. Why don't you speak in Afrikaans or something? I might be able to understand you better. Uh, you must have more fat than you have. And you must have your arms dear to say that the Kenobis can fast, Mark. Um, and then can you the hear a... Yeah, t Mark. Don't yes. Turn around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look what you made me do. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Oh, all right. That's your instructions, Mark. Oh, all right. I don't care whether you've been raised uh, from the dead uh, or not. I'll, st uh, I'll stick to talking to my doctor. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks. Wow. The reason for attempting that was not to be silly. But I appreciate that some of you have never heard what I'm talking about. And so when I say this, you're going to go, what does that mean? I've, I've gone rather loud now, Nick. <laughs> so I'm having to calm down. So what I'm going to do is give you simplistic, unlike Mark, <laughs> instructions of how to make this work. Are you ready? The first, they all begin with S. So I want you to write this down and I want you to know that I'm thinking that you have never worn this jacket before. The first S is the S of sequence. Say sequence. Let me move this table back to, near to the front again. Sequence is of the greatest importance with sewing. What I'm about to talk to you about is the word from the Bible, the word tithe, T-I-T-H-E, tithe. The Bible teaches us to tithe. And I know many people don't want to know this, but remember, God cannot be mocked. Don't get off track with this. I'm about to teach you how to wear a bigger jacket. This is simple. The most difficult thing is trusting God. Sequence. Now let me show you what happens with sequence. In my pocket, I did have, I still have. I've got 100 pounds in 10 pound notes. This is the way Many, many Christians operate with sequence. But what I'm about to show you is going to sound overly simplistic, but Mark proved to us and I proved to you that I can give out instructions and you get yourselves in a mess. So let me make it very clear where the buttons go, where the inside go, which end. You didn't tell me which end of the sleeve to put my arm in. You told me to put my arms in the sleeve. Here is 10, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 100 pounds. This is the way that the average person does it. Gas, electric, car, payment, fuel, mortgage, one, two, it used to be two, now it's three. Uh, mortgage, uh, kids, school, trips, all of that, food, growing teenagers, or a bit more for them. And, oh, ah, oh, fantastic. I've got my tithe left. Where does that go? Is there an offering bucket anywhere? Uh, that goes in the offering bucket there. That sounds very right, but is actually wrong. Because the sequence of the tithe is not 10%. The sequence of the tithe literally means the first 10%. So if I pick up, this, what I've put in the offering bucket, and I say, thank you very much, Champions Church. I'll take it back. Thank you. I didn't like the message. Give me back my money. <laughs> this is the way, since 17, and now I'm 62, I've been practicing tithing. I've got 100 pounds. Tithe first. God is able to bless now 90% more than he can bless 
The sequence is important. Now I'm going to pay food, car, gas, electric, mortgage, one, two, three. I'm going to do all that I'm going to do, and then I'm going to notice something, that the 90 is now stretched supernaturally, and I'm going to go, wow, how did that happen? I gave because tithing is not about money. Tithing is about trust. You say, I don't want to do it. That's okay. Don't do it then. Don't do it. But there will be always folk around that will keep you broke. Because they will say, ah, you, you don't want to go to that church. They believe in tithing. No, it's not champions church that has a policy of tithing. Champions church believes the Bible. And in the Bible, it says, return to me. Let me give you a couple of things. You can't sow your tithe down. You return a tithe up. This is the mistake you're making. You're putting your arms in the wrong holes. This is very key. I hear so many times, I tithe, Pastor Mark. I give 5% to the church. I give 1% to aunt so-and-so who lives away and she's in need, so I give her some. I send to compassion 2% and the list goes on and on until you get to 10%. Excuse me, God doesn't ask you to tithe like an apple pie. Or I just cut it up into pieces and, you know, as long as I give away 10%, it doesn't matter. So I send it to people and missionaries and family and friends and anybody in need. Excuse me, no, 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 no. You are mistaking it. You're putting your hands and arms in the wrong hole and it's all backwards. The way you tithe is that you bring and return it up. If you're sending it down, it's in the wrong direction. The only way God blesses the tithe, which is this year, and people say, tithe? What do you mean tithe? 10 pounds in the 100? Hey, have you ever thought about this, that God doesn't take 90 and gives you 10? He says, can I have 10 and you can have 90? And by the way, once you give me 10, this is going to multiply. Always has, always will. He will open the windows of heaven. One seed of obedience in the tithe authorizes heaven to open. But if you decide, oh, I'm not going to give it to the church because you know what? Pastor Mark may take it and spend it himself. Well, you don't know me then, do you? Wouldn't dare ever, 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 ever touch it. That's why I don't sign checks. I don't have anything to do with the finance of the church. I just get financial reports and I get on my knees and pray. Hello. Hello. However, there is a moment when you sow down sequence. Let me tell you what happens if you get the sequence out of order. When myself and Gillian were dating, on a Thursday night, which is quite a time before we were married, we were teenagers, and so we'd fallen in love. And on a Thursday night, for two years, Gillian, around about two years, on a Thursday night, we would join an outreach team in this area in this town, every Thursday night, summer, winter, snow, every condition, rain, never mattered. We never, we never stopped. And we would go door to door, knocking on people's doors, asking them one question. If you could know God in a personal way, would you like to? We knocked on hundreds of doors. That's not the point. The point is what happened afterwards. On that team, there was my girlfriend that I was dating, Gillian, 38 years married now. Yeah, that's what I said. How many? Oh, th oh I haven't got that wrong as well. <laughs> the last time I stood on this platform, it was 38, and now you're telling me it's 39. Next week is my 39th <laughs> wedding anniversary. And by the way, Mark and Jan are traveling the world because it's their 40th wedding anniversary. So that's a decision. Now, of course, I was just joking when I said 38. I knew it was my 39th wedding anniversary next week. I've got it all sorted and planned and everything, as you can see. Help me, Jesus. Mm. So the outreach finishes. 
There are two other young ladies on the team. Let's get this straight. I did not fancy them. <laughs> However, I heard a rumor that they quite like me. So we would give them, Gillian, a lift home. Gillian would get in the front seat, of course. The two young ladies in the back. However, on the way home, Gillian's house was first. You know what's coming. <laughs> Economy. Times were hard. So I drop my beloved off first, leaving the back two seats with two young ladies. And then I drop one off, leaving the back seat with one young lady. Then I drop her off. So after this amazing two hours of knocking on doors, asking people if they'd like to know Jesus, every time I dropped my beloved girlfriend off, she would slam the door. <laughs> I mean, God had blessed the night, but every, every night for two years, slam the door. I go, oh, hey. Do you know, I was so pig-headed, I didn't work it out for months. So one day, why is it we have a fantastic time on outreach, but you spoil it by slamming the car door? She said, you, well, I won't tell you what she said. <laughs> I can't remember. She said, haven't you worked it out that you are supposed to drop them off with me in the front? <laughs> no. <laughs> Your house is first. She said, I don't care if I live in Timbuktu. You still drop them off first. And yeah, no, I don't need you either. <laughs> we had so many rows. And then when she slammed the door, I'd wheel spin. You know, <laughs> off I go. The two girls in the back. Ah! I said to my, I said to Jillian, what do you think them two girls think in the back when you slam the door every time? I'm thinking, what are they going to think? She said, they're going to understand you're an idiot. <laughs> it's called sequence. You get it out of sequence, and that's what you get. Now you can try doing it the other way, but God said, hey, I will not be mocked. Don't turn your nose up at my plan. This is God's financial plan for your life. Tithe, first, temper. Can't afford it. Can't afford not to. I told you honestly last week how we were advised, don't tithe because you've got no money. We said never. For 40 years now, I have proved that this works because God works. So today is the day to start tithing. <laughs> tithing. 100 pounds in the thousand, 10 in the hundred, 10 pence in the pound. God said, if you will do that and trust me, I will open the windows of heaven. The first thing about seed is sequence. The second, so that's returning. You don't give to God a tithe, you return it. It belongs to him. He's the landlord of this earth. Your breathing is air. He could take it away from you any moment of any time. Ask Mark. He's had his life taken away from him twice. And God wanted him back. God can go, that's it, you over. Listen, get your heart right. This is not my thinking. This is not my opinion. This is not our church's Oh, read the handbook of the church. Oh, you have to tithe. Stop it. This is God. This is the Bible. God is rather large. Hello. He knows what he's doing. He said, if you'll trust me, I'll bless this. Stop it. Get on with it. Number two. So we send our tithe up. You say, what did it do? Put it on the end of the bed and the angels come. No, you put it in the offering bucket. The church is God's way of collecting the tithe. Number two is the soil. Say soil. The soil that you plant into authorizes the seed to grow or not to grow. Soil. Where you plant and what you planted into 
determines the growth of your seed. And that is called an offering. Whether it's the building fund, or now you can send that to family in need, or the poor, or champion's kitchen. You can give it wherever you want. God doesn't say, I need it there. You do it. But remember this. You can sow down the offering, but never the tithe. Tithe up, sow down. You say, this is so simple. Yeah, well, that was putting a jacket on was so simple. That's why Mark had to explain it in such a terrible way that I didn't know how to put it on. You tithe, you sow down. Uh, somewhere, here we go. We bought these, Gillian bought these seeds along with many other packets in a beautiful old shop with an old man behind an old counter from Portugal. I am most disappointed that I'm going to actually catch a flight soon to take them back because he showed me a picture on the front of what was going to happen to these seeds and I have to say that nothing has happened since we got home. The picture on the front has never been realized. In fact, if you listen carefully, you can, you can still hear the seed inside. That old geezer there told me I would get these flowers from this seed. What was the problem? I haven't planted them. You know, if seeds had conferences, they would make laughing stocks of Christians. Lord Jesus, I'm in total need of finance. Please help me. Jesus, send me some money. So seed, you idiot. Well, no, God wouldn't call you that, but I did. <laughs> so the idea is you open the packet and you sow it into soil. That's why most people come unstuck. We love Jesus. We pray about money, but it never happens for us because we didn't realize, or if we did realize, we don't do it. We don't sow seed. Now, don't sow into something that God is killing off. Don't try and put it on a life support machine with your money. Many years ago, all, the offering, all, all of the tithe of this church, what we call the missions account, we used to send anywhere across the world, oh, bless them, bless them, bless them, bless them. I said, hey, the problem is we don't know, we don't know them. We don't know if they're using the money. So now you need to know this church only sows its seed into places we know, people we know, churches we know, because we know that what the soil is. If you are distributing your money, oh, I'm spiritual, I'm sending it everywhere all over the world, stop it for a moment. Maybe you're keeping something alive that you shouldn't. It's called soil. But remember this, this little pretty picture on here is just the same as the pretty picture in your head. You'll never realize the dream unless you open the packet and sow it in the soil. Now you sow soil down, you sow seed down. The third one is the season. Season. Isaac sowed in the worst climate. Now listen carefully, coming to a close. The season that you sow in the critical crisis season. Maybe you are stony broke. Thank you so much to everyone that got on board last week in the last seven days. Miracles have happened in this church. But you need to know this. In a critical crisis season, your seed, your offering is multiplied because it's rare in a famine for seed to duplicate a hundred times. So if you're in a critical crisis season, we've proved this time and time again, that what you give in a crisis season, God magnifies because of where you are in a season that is critical. And God says, thank you so much. Number four, sacrifice. Here we're going to read from Mark chapter 12, very quickly. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came in, put in two very small copper coins, two pennies, calling his disciples to him. 
they were worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this woman, this poor woman has put in more than the treasury than all of the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she has given out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. One man, one woman can give 10 pounds and have 10,000 left in the bank. Another person can give 10 pounds and have nothing left in their purse. Tell me which one God looks on favorably. The one with 10 grand left in the bank, they both gave the same amount. It's called sacrifice. In the church, we don't believe in equal giving. We believe in equal sacrifice. First of all, a tithe is a tithe to anybody. Whether you've got a hundred pound or a million pounds, it's a different amount. It's equal giving. It's equal sacrifice, not equal giving. This lady has appeared in the Bible for 2,000 years because she gave up everything. So that's the second, that's the fourth one. And now number five, we find the fifth S is uh, the size of your seed. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, here we find it. Last one, band are coming up, going to worship, you ready? Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Some of us have got so used to giving out of a thimble and we want a wheelbarrow back. God says, time to step up the size of your seed. I'm not saying this to try and be showy in any way. I'm just humbly coming to you, I hope, with a, a right spirit just to say this. For years, we struggled to give an, um, above our tithe and offering. Until God challenges one day, Mark, give a thousand. A thousand. I've never given a thousand. I noticed something happened in our life when that happened. Because the Bible says when you sow generously, you will reap generously. Some of you have been sowing a, thousand, a, a thimble for 40 years. God bless me, God bless me. God says, listen, I will, but I'm, 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 according to this word, I can't bless you any more than this. When are you going to step up? Today is the day for a step up. Say, God, I'm going to trust you. This is not about, oh, let me just give you an illustration. I'm, I'm thinking whether I should, yeah, I'm going to give this. There's somebody in our church, this is what I found out just this week. This person a few days ago was blessed for a certain reason. They were blessed. Somebody in our leadership team was blessed with 800 pounds. And God challenged them before they ever received the money. Whatever you get from this source, they knew something was coming. They said, God said, I want you to give it. So they willingly gave it, and it was 800 pounds. Not 799, not 750, not 700. They said, Lord, it's all yours. Now watch this principle at work. Three days later, their account is empty because they've given 800. They look into their account. True story. I could take you to the person who will verify it. Three days later, they look into their account, and from a different source, there is 2,500 pounds in their account. Yes, come on, come on. Let's stand to our feet this morning, shall we? The size of your seed determines the size of your harvest. Now remember, tithe up, sow down. What you sow down will determine the size of of your harvest. I said it would be simple. It's like buttoning up a jacket for the first time. You go, wow, I've never heard that before. Well, that's why I kept it simple. I'm gonna show you two photos as we close. I'll move to the side. The first one, here's our new dog, Mabel. This is Percy the park keeper. This is the field where I walk them every day. You can see there's nothing in the field. It doesn't appear that there is, but underneath these ridges here, it's been plowed. 
And I know, because I'm there every day, that the farmer, I didn't see him do it, but I know what's under there. There is one potato every few meters. Just one potato, boring potato. So two weeks after the potatoes, here's the next picture. That now is old. That was just, what, a week or so ago. Today, when I go over there, masses. That farmer knew what some Christians don't know. If I want a potato harvest, I need to sow potatoes. You with me? Now watch this. It's not impressive because you're potatoes, potatoes. One potato sown reaps five pounds of potatoes. Five pounds of potatoes can serve ten people. Oh, I love a bit of mash. Oh, no, I prefer roast on a Sunday. One potato after one planting serves ten people. But watch what happens. When the farmer takes the five pounds of potatoes and puts them in line and sows five pounds of potatoes, have a guess what? He's, he's, he then is able, after one planting, to feed 25 people. If he does that again with what he's just received, have a guess what? On the third planting, he's now able to serve 250 people mashed potatoes. Some of us are going, Lord bless my potato. My potato is so humble. Lord, I've been praying over this and there's little bits coming out of it. And Lord, it's gone all squidgy and soft. And Lord, I, I wish you'd bless my potato. Plant it. Sow it. Stick it in the ground. Give it away. Isn't it amazing? that the person who doesn't believe in sowing and reaping is stuck with a grimy, squidgy, soft potato with all these tubes coming off it. They go, ah, there's like spiders. But the person that went, hey, I believe in sowing and reaping, after the third sowing has got 250 loads of mash to give away. Come on, folks. This is pretty simple. But it requires a level of trust. Thank you, Jesus. Right now, we're going to take up today's offering because you know why? Because when you preached a series, two weeks, and a message like this, it would be wrong to say, now go away, off you go. Because I'm going to give you the next few moments as we draw to a close with this worship just to come bring your offering. I think I want to switch up that last song before you press that. What was the third song we did today? No, the, the third song we did today? Worthy. worthy. Was it worthy? Was that the third? It doesn't matter what it was, but it was called worthy. Was it the fourth? As you know, I'm very good with numbers. I was obviously lost in the worship. I'm going to switch it out because I just feel maybe this is the song that we need to do. Now, I know that many of you give, you go, well, there wasn't many people who put, the, put it in the bucket. That's not very encouraging, is it, out of all these people? No, it's because you know that over 60%, 70% of the people now in our church don't give in the bucket. They give through Bax Transfer, app, online, only a small percentage. But today is your moment to step up. Can I just say this again, folks? We love you. We appreciate you. In this critical crisis season that the world is in, the church is in, and all of that, but you know how God is faithful. God is good. He's amazing. Let's draw to a close. Let's just, just ask the Holy Spirit, what, what do I need to do today? Do I need to give today? Now watch the miracles start to flow. If you want a huge bag of potatoes, hey, don't hold on. If you want beautiful flowers in the garden, don't hold on. 
If you want your life to financially step up, don't hold on. So what you have. So up, so down, so all around. Thank you, Jesus. We pray for you. Come on, everybody. Let's just get into this mode, moment of worship. Heavenly Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, work in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. Thank you for the gift that we get to sow and to reap. Thank you, Lord, for my tithe that you said, when I give my tithe, you will open the windows of heaven. Lord, I've never done this before. I didn't know how to do it. But right now, Holy Spirit, please teach me how to do it in the name of Jesus.